Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. I do hope you're doing remarkably well and loads and loads of love to each and every one of you. I'm doing fabulous, thank you very much. And don't forget to get that quintessential glass of drink, whether it's a hot cup of cocoa, whether it's a nice ice cold glass of apple tizer, whatever it is, you go and get it because I've got a fabulous story for you tonight. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I sat up in my bed and switched on my bedside lamp, glancing at my alarm clock that was ticking very loudly. It was ten o'clock at night. Why did I feel so uneasy? In my gut I felt something was seriously off, but why I felt this way was irrational, arbitrary and incongruous. It was a very quiet night, apart from the distant sound of coyotes and the occasional hooting owl that came from the forest from the rear of our property that encircled our small town. But those were normal calls and were not something that stood out on this occasion. Yet in the air I felt a rising sense of tension and apprehension that I couldn't fathom. My wife Jean was away on a two-week conference at her work, and yes, her absence from our home in the Pacific Northwest did make the house seem more empty without her presence, but it wasn't that that was bothering me. I ambled over to my bedroom window that faced the street and pulled back the velvety curtains to peer outside, but all I could see were the muted street lights and the verdant green grassy sidewalks graced with a long line of oak trees and the smooth tarmacked road along with the straight line of neighbours' properties staring back at me from the opposite side of the road. But everything was noiseless, and the occasional neighbours' outside lights had been left on. But otherwise, nothing weird was going on. I potted down the stairs towards the kitchen and made myself a hot cup of chocolate, which I lavishly topped with marshmallows, as spoiling myself was something I was always inclined to do when the wife was away. I could see our family St. Bernard lying on his doggy bed with his ears cocked backwards as if he was alert to something going on that I was oblivious of. You feel it too, Otis, I said. I'm not the only one. Something is definitely up. But what? That's the big question, I said, as I talked to him affectionately, stroking his silky coat. Otis trotted over to the living room window and let out a whine and poured at the wall a few times and looked up at me as if to say, why don't you look over there? So without much prompting required, I pulled back the curtain of the living room window, and that was when I saw my neighbour, Peggy Gold, engaging in some kind of verbal altercation with her daughter Giselle. They were in the kitchen in the detached next-door neighbour's property, and I could see everything going on very clearly, and believe me, it was dramatic. Peggy Gold was one of the most composed, self-restrained, easy-going woman I knew that was barely ever rattled. But on this occasion, she was pointing her finger angrily and accusingly at her daughter Giselle, whom appeared to be sobbing uncontrollably and waving her arms above her head in grievous despair and even blocking her ears as her mother began to shout and shout at her. I knew Richard Gold was away on a business trip and he was an exceptionally good friend of mine but something had caused his two loved ones to become unduly distressed, so I decided to see if I could be of help. I was not the intrusive, busybodying type, but much more inclined to leave sleeping dogs to lie, but on this occasion I could taste and sense the trouble in the air, and I couldn't just walk away and do nothing to help. I put on my dressing gown and slippers hastily and ventured very boldly to the front door of the next-door neighbour's house and I could hear the most god-awful, discomposing and raucous shrieks coming from inside the house that sounded like two fishwives on a bad hair day at the market. How could you, Giselle? How could you do this dreadful thing? I could hear Peggy scream. I'd never ever heard her raise her voice a day in my life. I'm sorry, Mum. I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I was just so scared. That's no excuse. This is not acceptable. What would your father do if he knew what you'd done? He would be ashamed 
ashamed to call you his daughter. Please, Mum, please, please try to understand, understand what I was going through. It's too late, it's all over, and it's your fault. How could you do this to me? How could you do this to your father? And what about you? What about your life? You're going to have to live with what you've done. The sobbing was out of control, and I knocked on the neighbour's door. Coming! I could hear Peggy calling. Peggy Gold came to the door reluctantly, and her tousled dark brown long hair looked as if she'd been dragged through a hedge backwards, and the mascara on her eyes had been rubbed around her streaked face so much that her eyes were now blackened, resembling a raccoon. And her blue eyes looked so pink as if she'd been crying. Peggy was a woman who never had a hair out of place, so seeing her so dishevelled like this was very eye-opening indeed. I watched as she tried to compose herself by straightening her back, as she peered at me from behind the open doors, with eyes that did not seem to focus on me, as she appeared to be trembling with anger. "'Hello, Santiago. What is it you want?' she said, sighing, as if the sight of me on her doorstep was so irritating and that I was the last person in the world that she wanted to see. I truly think a bedraggled vagrant would have been more preferable for her than to see me. "'It's half past ten, she snapped, with an underlying aggression in her voice. "'What are you doing here, Santiago?' she said, trying to act nonchalant, but not being very successful in hiding her obvious distress and angst. "'Richard is away. What do you want with me?' she demanded again. I'm concerned, Peggy. You can act like nothing is going on, but I don't buy it. I could hear you and your daughter screaming in the kitchen there, and I saw you from my living room window. I don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that something has clearly upset you tonight, and I'd really like to help. You know that Richard would not be happy if I didn't intervene to help you both in some way. I'm sorry, Santiago, but everything is fine here, said Peggy in a curt tone of voice. Nobody asked you to come snooping around and spying on us. You really love putting your great big nose into everybody else's business like a pig in a trough. Quite frankly, what goes on behind closed doors is none of your business, she said, trying to slam the door in my face, which would have been unusually abrupt and rude for the very amenable woman. No, Mum, let Santiago in. Maybe he can help us. Peggy didn't look convinced and eyed me with a degree of scepticism, as if she doubted I could calm down anything in her kitchen. She looked at me with a very stern expression on her face. If you want to help us, Santiago, I'm going to have to ask you for your promise to remain completely discreet, for if anyone was to learn about what has happened, most particularly the police, we will be in serious trouble. I don't think even my husband can know about this, for it would distress him way too much to uncover what we're going to share with you tonight. I won't tell the police anything, nor will I tell Richard. I just want to help, I said. Let me in. I was led into the living room, and my presence seemed to calm down Peggy and Giselle. Well, for a moment at least. So what is going on? Please tell me, I asked. Do you happen to know where the rubbish van takes rubbish, asked Peggy suddenly, which seemed a rather strange thing for her to ask me. I can try and find out for you. It shouldn't be too much of a problem. But if you have thrown away a diamond ring or something like that, you will never find it. Have you thrown away something of value? You could say that. My daughter has only just thrown away my grandchild, she piped. Oh, mother, please shut up, cried Giselle. Stop being so mean. It wasn't like that. It really wasn't. I was scared. I didn't know what was happening to me. I thought you'd be angry. I was overwhelmed by shock. I wasn't thinking straight. You thought I would be angry, young lady? Not as angry as I am right now. It's my grandchild we're talking about out there. And for all I know, she could be dead, said Mrs. Gold, breaking into sobs. How could my daughter do this to me, Santiago? 
It's too terrible, she said, blowing her nose into the tissue. Please, will you both be quiet and tell me exactly what is going on? How can I be of help if you two keep talking over each other like belligerent, cantankerous teenagers? Get a grip, will you both? I gave birth to a baby, said Giselle. When? I asked. I had no idea. Richard didn't tell me you were pregnant. You're only a kid, for heaven's sake. Are you not too young to be having babies? I, I, I didn't know I was pregnant, said Giselle. I thought I'd picked up a little weight, that was all. And I tried. I was struggling to lose it. I didn't have a clue as to what was going on. I woke up yesterday morning with dreadful pains in my belly and I went to the toilet and, and my waters broke. And that was when the baby came out in the toilet. I was so shocked and scared. I didn't know what to do. And especially when it began to cry. I cut the cord. I didn't even look at the baby. I just couldn't. I couldn't look at it. I tried to pretend it was all an awful dream. And I thought Mama would be mad as hell. So I just grabbed the baby and, and I plonked it in an old yellow baby blanket and put it on top of the dumpster with the rest of the rubbish outside. I was terrified. Later on I thought about the gravity of what I'd done and I went to the dumpster to check on the baby. But the rubbish had been collected an hour later. Finally, I told Mum, because I couldn't keep this secret to myself. It, I wanted the baby back. What am I going to do, Santiago? She sobbed. I, I can't believe what I've done. You put your baby in a dumpster, I said. I know what you must think. You must think so badly of me. I wasn't thinking straight. I, I, I was in such a state of shock. You stupid, stupid girl, screamed Peggy. That was my grandchild we're talking about. How could you be so heartless? Calm down, the both of you. You've got to stop screaming. We need to start by being practical, I commanded. We can make some discreet phone calls to find out if an abandoned baby has been found. But the two of you, you need to stop overreacting. You're not helping anyone by tearing each other's hair out like this and snapping at each other like angry alligators. I have made phone calls, cried Peggy. What do you think I've been doing all this time? How long can a baby survive without its mother's milk? Santiago, my grandchild is probably dead, and he's buried in some landfill or something. My daughter doesn't even know whether it's a girl or a boy. This is just too dreadful for words. What? What are we going to do? Peggy, would you please listen to what I'm saying and listen hard? Before you judge Giselle too harshly, I'd like to point out to you that your daughter is 16 years old. Can you imagine what it must be like to be so young and to go to a toilet and discover a foreign thing coming out of you? It must have been terrifying for your little daughter and she had no time to process any of it. Your daughter did not have a chance to come to terms with the fact that she was pregnant. She was obviously afraid to tell you what happened, which is perfectly normal given her young age and her naivety. She's still only a child herself, but she did go back to get her baby. But now it's gone. This leaves me to conclude that someone picked up your baby, and it's either safe and well, or otherwise this late in the day... It's unlikely to be alive. Either way, you two need to bite the bullet and get a grip. You both have to be strong, whatever the outcome is. Do you understand? After my speech, mother and daughter embraced and both nodded in agreement. I've been too hard on you, sweetheart, said Mrs Gold. But we need to do everything in our power to recover the baby, even if it is dead. You won't say anything to the police, will you, Santiago? Nor to my husband. I don't want my daughter locked up for murder. What good would that do? She's suffering enough. And if Richard knew about this, it would break his heart. I will not be saying anything to anyone, and that's a promise. 
I will go to all the landfill sites and leave no stone unturned to find your baby. In the meantime, the two of you need to be very strong. And I can't press this point enough. You need to be a support system for each other. And you cannot afford to overreact. Or if you do, when Richard returns, he will know something's up. And you don't want that to happen, do you? Of course not, said Peggy. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you for all your help. I really appreciate your discretion in this matter. Thank you. And so it was that I left no stone unturned in trying to find the abandoned baby for the Gold family, and I spent hours upon hours in landfill sites, digging through trash, phoning hospitals and police, while remaining inconspicuous and anonymous, as I was desperate to find answers. Finally, I had to deliver the bad news to the Golds. I'm sorry, I told them. I have stopped at nothing to try and find your baby. But we're going to have to assume the worst. I think it must have passed away. I'm very, very sorry. Giselle burst into tears. Mum, I've killed my baby. I'm a murderer. What have I done? Now you listen to me. Don't you dare talk about yourself like that in that derogatory fashion. You know that this was a terrible accident, said Mrs. Gold, wrapping her daughter in her arms. You made a dreadful mistake, and that happens from time to time. Your mother's right, I said. When I was growing up, we had a beautiful white German shepherd. She was very young and gave birth to about four puppies when she was a puppy herself. I remember she was out of her depth. The following morning she had accidentally rolled over all four of her puppies, killing them all. Our vet told us it was because she was an inexperienced mother who was overwhelmed, beleaguered and almost besieged by something she didn't understand. My mother was very cross with the dog, but the vet said she was being completely unreasonable. It's young and naive, it's only a puppy, he told her. It doesn't understand what's going on. Of course, when she was older, she had another litter and she was the best mother in the entire world. She looked after those puppies as if her life depended on it. One day when my father was driving into our driveway, one of her puppies nearly got run over, but she ran towards it, lifted its neck in its mouth and sped away. You were out of your depth, Giselle, just like the German shepherd mother. No one can blame you for that. I have taken the liberty of finding the number of a very good trauma counsellor that I would advise you both to visit. I gather she's very good. A month had passed by, and life had returned to normal in our small rural town, and my wife had completed her two-week company course, and was incredibly enthused about the product lines her company wanted to endorse. It must have been on a Friday morning that Richard Gold phoned me, and asked me if I fancied going fishing for the weekend at their little cabin, only twenty minutes out of town. Richard and I had grown close over the years, and sometimes it was good to escape all the estrogen in our lives and embrace an all-man-inspired weekend away where we could drink beer, barbecue, talk and fish. On this occasion I did feel rather guilty about harbouring a secret from Richard, but I knew it wasn't in his best interest to know the truth about his grandchild because it would cause him undue distress, and what was the point in opening that can of worms? Before long Richard was driving down the bumpy road in his red jeep scrambler, towards the very darkly stained, rustic, somewhat primitive log cabin made from rough-hewn wooden timber beams that were as simple and straightforward as you could get. The cabin was rarely one extended room that consisted of the kitchen, living room area and bedroom, with three single beds cluttering up the far end of the cabin in rather a tight squeeze. The mattresses had to be moved, sealed and packed away during the winter months, as mice tended to burrow themselves into the foam. There was an outside toilet and shower that was in a hut made out of timber beans. We used profane light for the lanterns at night, and there was a wood-burning stove that kept the cabin warm and snug, and a gas cooker and gas refrigerator, so it was very basic and rudimentary. I always enjoyed coming here, and on this occasion it was no different. It was good to get away from the town, and I was looking forward to doing a little fishing at the local lake. We unpacked all our stuff in the cabin, and armed with our cooler of beer along with our fishing tackle, we found a great spot to fish by the lake. 
and at first it was very annoying, for it seemed that the fish were not biting. Richard reached for a beer and pulled back the ring can lever and began to drink. Woman, he said, sighing deeply, that wife of mine has been a bag of tension lately. I'm not going to kid you, but I'm glad to be away from her. Oh, you mean Peggy, I said. I think it must be to do with female hormones, said Richard, but Peggy is not going through the menopause. But I promise you she has changed recently and has morphed from an easy-going mouse to a feisty dragon. And I'm not enjoying the dragon at all. That bad, I said. Oh, you don't want to know, sighed Richard. Anything gets that wife of mine blowing steam these days. Oh, I don't know what's got into her. If I was to compare her with a dog, I would say that she used to be as gentle and as graceful as a greyhound. But now she's belligerent and yappy. She's like one of those nasty little terriers that can't stop snapping at your feet and giving you little nips here and there. It's quite a metamorphosis, bro, he continued. Oh, the other day I returned home from a hard, stressful day at work and I sat down to watch some sports on the television in order to unwind. I've always done that in the past and she's never battered an eyelid. Not any more. She stood in front of the television, oscillating her arms like an angry octopus and said, Can you see me, Richard? I'm right here. I said, Yes, love. It's hard not to see you. You're blocking the television. It would be very nice, Richard, if you actually paid your daughter a little bit of attention, rather than slobbing away on the couch like a great big lumbering oaf. Maybe things wouldn't fall apart in our household if you were more hands-on as a father, instead of wrapped up in your own little world. At that, I got up to go and help her in the kitchen to appease her disgruntled state. I saw she was frying garlic in the olive oil for the tomato sauce she was making for the pasta, and so I stepped in to help her. Look, she screamed, you're burning the garlic, and now the sauce is going to be bitter. You better get out of here. You're about as much use as a hamster on its wheel. So at that I returned to the television to proceed in watching my sports game again, and Peggy became enraged. Now this time she was blowing hot smoke. What did I tell you about watching TV, she shrieked. Why don't you pay your daughter some attention? So I went off to Giselle's room, knocked on her bedroom door to hear my daughter shouting, Leave me alone, Dad. Can I come in, I asked her, and reluctantly she opened the door for me, and I went to sit at the end of her bed. So how are things, I asked, feeling awkward. I mean, what do you say to a teenage daughter? At that, my daughter blew up. I'm fine, Dad. What are you asking me so many questions for? Please get out. Oh dear, I said. You have been having a hard time. Tell me about it, said Richard. You can hit the tension in my home with a knife. And to tell you the truth, I'm glad to be out of there. I did ask my wife if she was going through the menopause because her skin was so flushed and I thought she was having one of those, what do you call it, hot flashes. And when I suggested that this might be why she's so tense at the moment and highly strung, she nearly throttled me because she's in her thirties. I'm too young to be going through the menopause, she screamed. Are you trying to tell me I'm old? You really do know how to make a woman feel attractive. And at that, she started to hit me with the back of her magazine. She was completely exasperated with me. Well, we're here now, Richard. So let's enjoy ourselves and forget the woman in our lives for the moment. Cheers, said Richard, raising his beer. I can well drink to that. Richard and I had a very enjoyable day and finally managed to catch some trout at the lake. And we proceeded back to the cabin and made a fire pit outside under the stars where we grilled the delicious flaky fish, which we ate with melted butter and garlic, with potato and Greek salad, which was served with warm focaccia bread. It was very, very yummy. We opened a few more beers and listened to the sound of the crickets and frogs serenading the night. All of a sudden we could hear whooping sounds across the valley. What the heck is that? I asked Richard. I've given up identifying the strange sounds of the night, said Richard. It's not the first time I've heard sounds like that before when we've stayed out here. It sounds like some kind of a primate, but what it is I can't imagine. It could be absolutely anything. 
After a while, I was convinced we were both being watched by a pair of unseen eyes, which left me feeling very unnerved. But when I asked Richard if he could sense a presence, he laughed and said, Don't go all weird on me, bro. I've had enough of that from my wife. Yet despite everything, I really sensed we weren't alone on that night. And as I looked in the direction of the tall ponderosa pines and Douglas fir trees, I could have sworn I'd discerned some red eye shine eight feet off the ground. But when I looked in that direction again, the eye shine had gone. And so I told myself my imagination was playing tricks on me. It was in the middle of the night that I got up to answer a call of nature. By that time, Richard was fast asleep and was snoring quite badly. And as the toilet was located in a hut outside of the cabin, I surreptitiously slipped out of the door as quietly as I could, not wishing to wake him up. I was wearing a headlamp on my head so that I could see clearly, but the night seemed to be quite bright this evening, with a moon very close to being almost full. As I made my way outside the door towards the toilet cubicle, I knew that something or someone was standing close by to me. It was an airy, almost ghostly feeling. Hello, I said, looking around. Is anybody there? But everything was very silent. I thought I was going mad. I went off to relieve myself and could hear a rustling sound, and then twigs being broken beneath hefty feet, and I knew someone or something was out there. By this time my hair was standing on edge, and my heart was pounding in my chest violently. I knew something was furtively lurking outside the hut, and my rifle was back in the room, so I better make a dash back to the cabin as quickly as I could to retrieve it. I surreptitiously crept out of the hut, looking to my left and right as quickly as I could, but then standing only yards away from me, I saw a monstrous-looking creature, and my heart nearly did a double flip because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I must be dreaming, I told myself, but I realised I was not dreaming at all. The thing that I was staring at was very definitely real. It was clear that the creature, whatever it was, desired my attention, for she was indicating for me to follow her, which for me was a little like the house tabby cat, trying to reassure a mouse that it did not want to eat it. I felt completely out of my depth, and wondered if this was some kind of sinister plot or ploy or even trap, but some deeper instinct inside me, or an internal voice, told me just to go. I followed the creature cautiously, keeping a very safe, weary distance behind her. I would describe this powerful, brawny, sinewy, muscular beast as about eight and a half foot tall, seven hundred pounds, with a shoulder circumference of three feet across, with a human-like body, but only gigantic in size and proportion. It was covered in dark, layered hair, and smelt very strongly of pine needles and sweat. The creature had overlong arms and a pyramid-shaped head with a pointed tip, rather like a primate, but with those two exceptions in mind, the creature was almost completely human, with a face that looked like an indigenous Indian. To my amazement, the creature stopped, turned around, looked directly at me, held up her hand like you and I would do to tell someone to stop and to wait. Then the creature picked up something in her arms off the ground and handed it to me. I nearly had a heart attack on the spot when I realised I was holding a baby in my arms. A human baby, wrapped in a yellow baby blanket that was gurgling happily and looking at me with bright big blue eyes. The critter looked at me directly, as if determining whether she could trust me to take care of this human baby. And she seemed satisfied by my reaction, because she pointed to me and then to the baby as if to say, You look after that human baby for me, please. I watched her glide away into the woods, moving into the heart of the forest with a seamless grace, and I remember thinking, what the heck was that? As I glanced at the baby, I thought about Giselle. Could this be her baby? Surely not. And then I knew that it had to be. And that critter must have found it in the dumpster and nursed it to health. I ran to the cabin as fast as I could, my heart filled with exuberant enthusiasm, and I ran over to Richard to wake him up. Richard, I said, wake up, wake up, Richard. He groaned. I began to shake him more and more excitedly, and he was half asleep. What's going on, bro? What's the matter? Meet your grandchild, I told him. Richard sat bolt upright in bed and looked at me as if I'd lost leave of my senses. 
Bro, I haven't got a grandchild, he said. What the heck are you on about? And where did you find that baby? I watched his expression changed when he saw the yellow baby blanket. Where did that baby blanket come from, he asked me, looking perturbed. That blanket was knitted by my mother for Giselle when she was a baby. How did you find it? I knew I had to tell Richard the whole story about what had happened with his wife and daughter and the strange creature that I had encountered. Richard took the baby in his arms, and it was love at first sight. He was besotted and beguiled by his beautiful granddaughter. I can't believe this is Giselle's, he said. Do you know who the father is? I shook my head. Sorry, I'm not sure about that. It must be the boy that she's been seeing. What's his name? Wayne Montague. He's been swooning over my daughter for many years like a male peacock. That boy's been besotted over Giselle since they were in nappies together. As you can imagine, we both dived into Richard's car in the middle of the night and drove back to their house twenty minutes away to introduce mother and granddaughter to the baby. I want to say words cannot describe the joy in that household that night. As tears flowed, champagne was poured, and laughter and tears filled the air. I felt so full of elation and joy, and it was a moment in my life that I will never, ever forget. To cut a long story short, Giselle chose to call her baby Maria, which means miracle, and Sahara, which means wilderness, as Giselle wanted to also name her daughter after the wild woman that we now know was a Bigfoot. So it was called Maria Sahara Gold, which means a miracle from the wilderness, which is very apt. I'm glad to tell you that I'm the child's godfather. It did turn out that Wayne was indeed the little baby's father, and in 1998 they both got married and raised a family all of their own, and were very happy together. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what a fabulous story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, goodbye and good night.